Rapture is filled corner to corner with detail and history, and the cast of characters that occupy this world are no less dynamic. Every splicer, every level boss has a story. In many ways, these characters are a reflection of their environment, and their environment, a reflection of their character. Let's talk about some of the characters in Bioshock. There's so many that fans love and there are many Wikia pages about them. You know, one thing that I think a lot of fans may not realize is you were telling stories with these characters, you know, a decade ago. And technology today, as we saw in, you know, a game like Infinite, you can do amazing things with facial expressions and storytelling. Conveying that emotion that you did 10 years ago with limited technology was challenging. How hard was it back in the day to sort of, you know, convey story in engine? We had such a small team that, you know, we had to show Tenenbaum or Atlas. They were just splicer models, right? Yeah. Oh, really? Tenenbaum wow. was Ladysmith, yeah. which is there. There's a reason that she's in shadow behind glass, and it's not to be dramatic. It's because we couldn't afford to build another. Really? Yeah. So we, just so, something as simple as that, like you couldn't afford to build. A we, model. We, we didn't have the. Yeah, we we there, we, there we were. Didn't have the, we had a few uh, character models in the game. There's the what, maybe eight or nine character models. Character model, really? Yeah. Wow. So we're like, oh, we'll put her in silhouette behind a light, and people think it's. Noir. And so much of it was driven by the, the voice performance, I feel like, yes. too, because I mean, that it all had to, it was like a radio play in many ways, still. Yeah, we had some really good actors, and I was able to spend a lot of time with them. And the fact that I could write the stuff, direct it, and then rewrite in the room, and the fact that we had actors who were, for whatever reason, you know, I, would, I, I wasn't even in the same room as them. I was on a speakerphone. Right. They were in a studio in New York or LA or something. I never met, I don't think I met any of them. Really? Uh, None of the actors in Bioshock you ever met in person when you were making the game? Maybe since, but at wow. the time I hadn't met a single one of them. That's except maybe a couple people like, you know, I played the Circus of Avis thing, Nate Wells played the, uh, the, the Jack on the, tr on the plane, you know, uh -huh. a couple of people in the studio. It was community theater, you know, in terms of the, the tech and the sort of time we had for it, but the actors were, you know, we had some and exceptional actors. I will say as, as, you know, doing animation on that game that you can hide bad animation behind really good audio and it makes the animation look better. We didn't have a tech animator, it was me. I'd never rigged characters before and I'm, now I'm rigging characters trying to figure out how, you know, to get all of these characters out right, to that, the animation yeah. team. So we're very limited when it came to animation tools. Yeah, Since but you, but apologize did, but to my the, animators. No, but yeah. you did the big, I mean, for your, your first game that you rigged the Big Daddy, which is, yeah. you know, it's not an easy character to rig. It was, you know, we figured it out, but the tools that we had on Infinite were not the tools that we had on Bioshock. So you, you, we figured out what we could do and what we could do well and, and tried to hide, kind of, you know, put into the darkness the things that we knew we couldn't do very well. And having voice actors of that caliber that can bring those characters to life, you tend to fill in the blanks. So tell me, friend, which one of the bitches sent you? The KGB wolf or the CIA jackal? Here's the news. Rapture isn't some sunken ship for you to plunder. And Andrew Ryan isn't the giddy socialite who can be strapped around by government muscle. And you did get to revisit Rapture in the DLC for Infinite, and you know, with today's technology or technology from a few years ago, it, I'm sure it was liberating for you guys in some ways to be able to, to use that tech to bring the environment and also characters to life. What was that experience like for you guys to go back and sort of revisit Rapture? It was liberating because we got to revisit it, but we also, I think when we started, thought we'd be able to go reuse some of the old assets <laughs> and they just didn't hold up anymore right. compared to the infinite assets. So we basically had to rebuild, not just rebuild everything from scratch, we had to reimagine it yeah. from scratch yeah. because, you know, it, it, we had the ability to make it look grander and bigger, but still feel like exactly like Rapture. It is a different kind of, we're making a different kind of experience than, than Bioshock 1, so it was tricky to find, to make it feel like it was the same kind of game because uh, it wasn't, you know, the first one was sort of an action game, the second one was really a stealth game. Um, you know, the Barrel Sea Part Two was really a stealth game, and you're really telling the story of Elizabeth throughout those things. Yeah. So it was a different lens, but it was also cool because it allowed me to make the whole story about Elizabeth, you know, yeah. to have her be central to the, the franchise from the very beginning, and she was always, you know, she became the heart of it to me, and to have her, it was really exciting for me to make her, you know, her heroism be 
something that set the events of Bioshock into motion, which eventually, you know, saves all the little sisters. That was, that was really gratifying, a nice way to tie the whole thing up for me. And you probably didn't have that idea 10 years ago, right? You had to yeah. retrofit it off. <laughs> I had no idea. He has Are a letter that he's plan? addressed to himself that's 10 years old. Yeah. But yeah. I don't know. We'll, we'll... I mean, for me, it was, it, was a, it was a nice way for me to say goodbye to Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite because, you know, those two worlds together. You know, you don't realize, or I don't think the audience realizes how much time you spend with these characters trying to get them out and polished and, and into the world. And it was a good opportunity, I think, as a game developer to kind of have that little coda at the end where you're like, okay, I, I get to, now I'm ready to move on to the next thing. I've had a nice, you know, break. Like, let, right. let's... Let's seal this off, and now, now I'm on to the next thing. And it was like 12 years of our lives, too. Between, yeah. Between the, little... the very beginning of it, and it was a long time. Well, I mean, so my daughter, who is 16 now, I did a lot of filming of her when she was oh, yeah. six as a little sister. Oh, wow. And this was, was not mocap, it was just running around the office. And I'm like trying to be like, um, now trip over the thing and pretend you die. Or like, you know, like trying to like not like Drink traumatize a six year old. Yeah. Pretend you're drinking something and you know, and I never showed her the actual game until much later. But she uh on BSI I used her I put her in a mocap suit and actually used her for the little sister oh, wow. in Paris uh -huh. that's running after the balloon. So that was kind of for me like a nice That's way to connect it all yeah. together. Were there any characters on the original game that you found hardest to write? I mean, you mentioned like, you know, recasting Atlas, things like that, but was there a character that was ch the most challenging for you, Ken? Well, Atlas, because, you know, he was basically written completely twice. That was yeah. very, very tough. And I was very happy about the original character, and I thought I'd really done something great. And then you showed it to people, and they just hated it, and they didn't trust him. And if they didn't trust him, we were screwed. All yeah. And so it was tough, because we, um, after having gone through all the recording, to actually have to let the actor go it's no fault of his own, right? right. That's, it was on us. He, he had invested in it, tell him that it wasn't going to happen, and rewrite it from scratch. That was hard, and that was, that was tough. And then after I finished it, I had a debate with somebody on the team who felt the accent was really, really phony. And we had an English person on the team, and he felt the accent was really, really phony. So at the last minute, we basically ended up doing a focus test in, in Ireland. Right. Um, oh, wow to see if people bought the accent. Because the, actually, the actor who was playing Atlas was Irish, uh -huh. but he was from a different part of Ireland, so he was okay. playing a different kind of Irish accent. Right. Um, I don't think he was from Dublin, and Atlas sort of had a Dublin accent. And so at the last minute, I thought I was gonna have to do it again. Oh, wow. And fortunately, the focus test came back, um, and, wow. it, and people loved it. I don't know how you survived that plane crash, but I've never been one to question Providence. I'm Atlas, and I aim to keep you alive. And a lot of the villains in the game felt like they were, you know, very much tied to certain levels. And this was, you know, you were still in an environment of levels with Bioshock, right? It wasn't just a big open world. Did that all sort of get designed together? It's like, here's the best villain that's going to fit to this environment and this theme of, you know, this area? Some of them work better than others. I mean, I think obviously Steinman, like Steinman and especially Sandra Cohen, really, I think, dominate in terms of the level they, boss. They are the levels. Know, yeah. They are the levels. And, and some of the characters didn't hold up as well, I don't think, um, on the writing side. The fun thing about the characters at work, like Simon, where he had all those little displays with the scissors and the tech, you know, like that was stuff the art team came up with to support that character. And obviously, Sandra Cohen, in that level, you know, I had this idea for this character and, you know, as this artist and, and taking Andrew Ryan's thinking to the extreme, you know, uh -huh. through a lens of art was really fun. They were really, I mean, in a lot of ways, they're sort of like more like Batman villains than they are like actual you know, real world villains that they all have a, you know, the Joker cares far more about the humor and the dark humor that he has and the Riddler cares more about the riddles than he actually does about money, you know, right. like the money, the crime is this afterthought, right. it's the philosophy. And so these characters have a lot in common with, and there's probably a lot of inspiration taken from sort of characters like the Joker in terms of a guy, like, like any of the characters in Bioshock, because they were really driven by their ideology, and but their ideology is a mask for their sense of selves, right? You know, this stuff is really, Cohen knows he's a hack, and he doesn't want to, you know, he can't admit that to himself, so he has to wrap himself in all this nonsense, because the last thing he could ever do is look in the mirror and say, I'm not much of an artist. No need to thank me for jamming the transmissions of those boors, Atlas and Ryan. Let them have their squabble. The artist, yes, 
The artist knows there is richer earth to till.